Job, do you like to play games? Yeah. Peter says you have the best games. Well, I have a game in my house that you might like to play. Would you like that? Yeah. Okay. It's the Popcorn Digest with Gareth and Andy. Hello and welcome to Stephen King's Popcorn Digest. I'm your co-host Gareth Green and joining me as always is my full-time co-host and part-time Stephen King solicitor, Andrew Raphael. Yeah, I've just been informed that Stephen King is pursuing a lawsuit for us using his name in front of the Popcorn Digest brand. Well, it's okay, you can tell him we're using it anyway. Yeah, yeah, and he's going to be suing us $10,000 for every day that we are in contempt. Actually, then, I might remove it if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, but we will continue to use it on our social media. Social media pages, yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. And today we're asking, what would happen if we permanently strapped an Oculus Rift to a simple gardener as we watch Stephen King's Rain Man the video game? <laughs> I mean the lawnmower man. <laughs> but is this virtual reality horror story virtually unwatchable? Find out after the trailer. From the imagination of Stephen King comes the story of a man. Yo, come on, boy, let's go. Grass is waiting for you. With the mind of a child. Yes, yeah, Cybo Man, he came to see me. Cybo Man, comics, right? Yeah, Cybo Man. <laughs> And a doctor. Virtual reality holds a key to the evolution of the human mind. With a vision of the future. I have a game in my house that you might like to play. Would you like that? Yeah. Okay. That was really bad. I have different games. I even have one that could help make you smarter. Now, ah! Job Smith is about to enter the world of virtual reality. Ah! It's gonna hit no, me. no, no, Joe, just relax. It's gonna be like being up there with the stars, Joe. They're going to another planet. His mind is like a clean, hungry sponge. <laughs> you just graduated to the next level, Joe. <laughs> Pierce Brosnan is luring children and simple folk into his basement with the promise of a good time in The Lawnmower Man, a film so bad that Stephen King. Yes, the man behind Dreamcatcher and the Langoliers forced the producers to remove his name from the title. Jeff Fahey is Simple Job, a gardener turned scientific subject to the VR experiments of his neighbour and with unexpected brain swelling and pants swelling results. Biblical parables, terrible CGI and a monkey forcefully strapped to an aero trim follow in this bonkers 90s sci-fi. <laughs> I'm thinking of the monkey. <sighs> <laughs> like that's what it opens with a I monkey know. in an aero trim just spinning round <laughs> whilst being subjected to this VR nightmare oh. yeah that's uh, that's probably one of my favourite cold openings to a movie <laughs> there's no half measures in this film no it starts as it means to go on it most certainly does so Andy I need to ask before this episode have you any experience with the lawnmower man before. Not as a film viewing experience. I think I watched a little bit of it a few years ago. But my general experience of the Lawnmower Man is more to do with 90s special effects and the virtual reality craze of the early 90s. When I was younger, I taped a documentary off the TV. I think it was a 1992 documentary called Theme Park Heaven which was an episode of Channel 4's Equinox. And I still have it to this day. It's one of my favourite documentaries, and I had it transferred from a video to a DVD one time because yeah. I loved it so I much. I honestly thought you were going to say it was on a documentary called Shit Films to Avoid at All Costs. <laughs> <laughs> no, it goes through all sorts of different theme park experiences, but the last yeah. part of the documentary was specifically about virtual reality and the applications of that and also how, at the time, people thought it was totally going to change human existence in a very short space of time they thought yeah. that by the turn of the millennium that vr would just be the thing and people would want to escape into that world and it would just change everything but yeah that's my general experience and also just i think at the time the lawnmower man was grouped into a small club of films where cgi was breaking boundaries and it was very much lumped in with jurassic park and Terminator mm -hmm. 2 and 
unfortunately, it's not stood the test of time along with no, those two other films. I don't think it stood the test of time within a just a couple of years as well, to be honest. I mean, because yeah. one thing that we do need to say, I know we go into the stats and facts normally at the end of the episode, but it was lumped in with those films, and I would say rather unfairly, because although it does have some very heavy special effects scenes in it that were rather groundbreaking for the time, perhaps, mm. it still had a budget that was quite modest like yeah. say more on the low budget to mid budget side of things i had yeah. a 10 million dollar budget in 1992 so even so they didn't really have the resources to do what the likes of jurassic park and terminator 2 were doing just by going from what the budget did allow and they didn't have studios like ilm on their side they were much more smaller just independent studios from silicon valley that were working on the movie yeah but I will say as well, my experience with this film, I do remember seeing it when I was a kid because I was very much into everything that had just a frame of CGI graphics, even if it looked like something from the Atari or, you know, if it was dated already, I, I would be all about that. I think because we grew up during that kind of CGI revolution. Yeah. I was very much caught up in that for pretty much the entire 90s as a film yeah, goer. Yeah. I would pick and choose my films based on whether or not the amount of CGI it would have and to just to see how far it had progressed. I mean, that led me to certain films like Dungeons and Dragons, the movie and yeah. that type of thing. So it wasn't always a good bet either. But yeah, I do remember seeing The Lawnmower Man in the 90s. And for some reason, I don't remember it at the cinema. I think I was too young then, but I remember it being prominent in the video shop mm. and uh, me as well, like them having standees up for The Lawnmower Man as well. And, I mean, that I must have been only about five years old, but I still remember that. And, yeah, I saw it in the 90s, and to be honest, I didn't remember anything about the film other than it having these VR moments. Mm. I couldn't remember anything further in regards to the story or that type of thing. And no. I actually revisited it some years later because of the How Did This Get Made episode that came out. And I don't think I managed to get all the way through the film because there's still parts of it that just like escaped my brain. And I don't know yeah. if it's just the effect of this film. that it's just I'm already trying to grasp at pieces of the film to remember to speak about for this episode. <laughs> So, so that's where I'm at with uh, The Lawnmower Man. And also, I do remember it being Stephen King's The Lawnmower Man as well. Yeah. Especially in the video shop. I remember those standees. I remember those posters in the video boxes with Stephen King's The Lawnmower Man. And for the longest time, I just thought this was a Stephen King film. Which I guess we should really go into, like, in terms of the context of this film. I will say that I've not really been able to find out much about the film. But I do understand that... You, Andy, have come across a uh, a few pieces of information online that yeah, you're going to yeah. relay to us about the making of the film. Yeah, so the original story of The Lawnmower Man was a, a short story written by Stephen King in 1975. I think it debuted in Cavalier magazine in that year. And then it was also included later on in his short story collection, uh, Night Shift, which was released in 1978. Yeah. And from that point onwards, it was optioned along with quite a few of the other short stories in that collection by Milton uh, Sabotsky and Andrew Donnelly. Oh, Sabotsky and Donnelly, of course. Yeah, yeah. I think they were called Sword and Sorcery Productions. And they'd optioned six of the 20 stories that are included in that Night Shift collection. And yeah. they were planning on making some horror anthology films that was a thing in the like the late 80s and early 90s to have these horror anthology i'm thinking like creep show and body bags and like twilight zone the movie yeah i mean that's yeah. a horror show for a whole different reason yeah i think they had yeah they had lawnmower man the mangler and trucks which i'm pretty sure became maximum overdrive maximum overdrive yeah so that's all lumped in with this nothing came of that and in 1984 Dino De Laurentiis, our great of course. friend Dino De Laurentiis. Uh, uh, friend of the show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why you not do Hannibal? <laughs> but yeah, he um, purchased the rights to three of these stories from those guys and also intended to make a horror anthology feature film because he was actually making one anyway at the time, which was called Cat's Eye, 
which was released in 1985. Yes, I've seen that film. If I remember rightly, it has one story that I remember. It's all told from the perspective of a cat going through these like different stories, um, and it's just really an observer in these stories. One oh, right, of them okay. is the lead actor from Airplane. Okay. And he's being forced by a mob boss to walk around the outside on a ledge on a high building in New York. And if he makes it around the perimeter of the building, he is let off the hook for whatever debt that he owes this mobster. And it's about his travel around it. And another one is about a goblin that steals the breath of children. That's all <laughs> I remember about that. I think that is the uh, cat's eye, Stephen King. All right, okay. So, again, nothing came of this. And in the late 80s, a company called Allied Vision had acquired the film rights to The Lawnmower Man. But yeah. they found that they were unable to expand the story into a feature-length film. Mm-hmm. So they decided to combine it with another completely unrelated script, which had been written by Brett Leonard and Gimmel Everett called Cyber God. And they just smashed the two together. And to be honest, when you read the original Lone Merman story, it is very peripherally in there as, as a story it is barely got yeah. anything to do with the eventual film the main story especially because it has a like pagan element it's pan isn't it the it's a satyr and he's killing people with this lawnmower as a sacrifice to his god pan yes that's it and this doesn't have any of that in it whatsoever there are some no. very peripheral references the fact that he kills somebody with a lawnmower and i think they mention on Wikipedia that there's one of the characters mentions in the film that some of the remains were found in the bird bath. Yeah, that's and about it. That's about the uh, the long and short of it, really. Yeah. So, Allied made the film and New Line Cinema acquired the distribution rights. In the run-up to the film, it was advertised frequently as Stephen King's The Lawnmower Man. And you yeah. can, if you just go on Google, you can see loads of different posters that clearly state that it is Stephen King's The Lawnmower Man. But King filed a lawsuit in May 92 against Allied and New Line, claiming that the film bore no meaningful resemblance to his short story, aside from the title and a brief two-minute long scene in which the lawnmower attacks and kills the abusive Harold Parquette, and insisted that his name be removed from advertisements and from the film's credits. A federal judge ordered the Lawnmower Man filmmakers to grant his request, but um, it was apparently the first time that a writer had successfully sued to have his name removed from a film since 1922, <laughs> when James Oliver Kerwood sued to have his name taken off I Am The Law. Is that a uh, Judge Dredd prequel? Oh, uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but Allied and New Line felt that the judge's ruling was too broad and might force them to remove prints already in circulation, essentially stopping the distribution of the film throughout the world. They appealed, and a three-judge panel issued a stay of injunction until the appeal was settled. And it basically meant that New Line had to cease King's name in the advertising, but it didn't mean they had to remove the based upon in the on-screen credit on the actual film. So it meant that they could still run the film with the credits as is, but they had to take it out of the advertising. I guess that begins to explain how the film then came to end up with his credit being restored for the uh, eventual VHS release of the film, just simply because they had scanned in a print of the film that had his name, rather than one of the ones that didn't. So apparently in 93, they'd reached a $2.5 million settlement. That's like a quarter of the budget. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but New Line continued to use King's name in advertising for the movie, violating their agreement. So in 1994, a federal judge found New Line in contempt of court for failure to remove King's name from video cassettes, packaging and posters. And yeah. on the 30th of March, 94, the judge gave New Line 30 days to comply or face a $10,000 a day penalty. Oh, wow. I mean, the thing is, I do joke about this as well, that the man behind, you know, such titles as The Langoliers and Dreamcatcher is, like, so concerned about his reputation (laughs) that he's suing New Line Pictures to have his name removed from the film. But it doesn't sound to me like it's got anything to do with the quality of the film. I mean, this is a man that regularly sells the rights to his films for a dollar to upstarting and upcoming new filmmakers just to see what they can do it's why we end up with a lot of like 
independent Stephen King films made on a small budget going straight to DVD or VOD. So I don't think this is an issue of quality. It's an issue of the fact that it's just got nothing to do with his story and his name's being taken for a ride. And so I get exactly where Stephen King is coming from in this regard. And he's not somebody as well, given the popularity he has. He's not somebody that requires the paycheck either. No. So, (laughs) I mean, the thing is as well that Stephen King, in terms of the adaptions, adaptations of Stephen King's material, there are definitely (laughs) a great number of bad adaptations and not too many good ones. Even so, I think this would have fallen very strongly into the bad adaptation Yeah, for me personally. And it's strange as well that the film reads like someone who's tried to copy elements of his style as well. It's yeah. a bit of a grab bag of elements from other King stories. I mean, you've got a bit of Carrie in there. You've got a yeah. bit of Christine. The uh, shadowy organization called The Shop is actually nicked wholesale from his uh, story Firestarter. Oh, I've not seen that one. That's the Drew Barrymore yeah, the yeah. film version. So it's it's got a lot of Kingy elements anyway, which I imagine they were trying to sort of say, that, oh yeah, this is a Stephen King story. Yeah. But I get that, but I feel like it's more so like the dressing of the film is Stephen oh, yeah, King, yeah. whereas the body of the film is entirely Philip K. Dick or uh, what's it, Flowers for Algernon. Yeah, the one that everybody it, yeah. always flowers references Algernon, yeah. with this one. It's very Flowers for Algernon. Those kind of pioneers of new sci-fi during the uh, 50s and 60s and 70s. Yeah. It feels more akin to that, but it's been dressed up as a Stephen King film because I do feel like even in the way that the community is as well, that's very Stephen King-esque as well. Like His films are not often focused on one or two characters. It's normally about a community facing something. Yeah, and this film has that as well. Like it has these very, very strange, almost out of Twin Peaks community characters as well. (laughs) (laughs) I get the feeling of that when I'm watching it, but it feels like David Lynch and Mark Frost very much had their tongue firmly placed in cheek when it comes to mimicking the soapy elements. Yeah, that the filmmakers behind this actually forgot about Mm. having any sense of irony to it. (laughs) Yeah, it's just painfully obvious that they've half-heartedly integrated this story into that original Cyber God script. Uh, I I don't even know where to start with this film because it's so all over the place. I think that's going to be an issue. Like, I've not got notes that really encompass the entire film. Like, normally I've got talking points to say, like, I want to speak about this character arc or this whole section of the film. Or I mean, we will talk about things like the CGI as well and Mm. (laughs) the qualities of the CGI. But my notes have been so singular and so based on small moments in the film that are just completely absurd. Like, my first note, as I was mentioning to you before the episode began, my first note is just me repeating one of the opening lines that Pierce Brosnan says, which is, fuck these political assholes. He's the best chimp I've ever had. (laughs) And I've I've written next to that, it's definitely beginning to sound like Brosnan fucked that chimp. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And Fuck the law. I want this chimp. (laughs) I love this chimp with all my heart. (laughs) To be fair, that is one of the best openings to a film. Like, the whole idea of you've got Brosnan talking about a chimp like it's one of his longtime lovers, and also it keeps on intercutting this conversation with this image of a chimp just spinning wildly in this aero trim. And then you cut to what it can see, and it's like going through some, I don't know, some like Atari version of Call of Duty, like, or Halo. And yeah. What real world application do we have for any of this shit? <laughs> like, oh, where are we sending this monkey to space? <laughs> I don't know. But oh, talk about clunky expositional dialogue as well in that opening exchange. You've got all the stuff regarding him having sex with the monkey, but <laughs> just the way that it sets up its application in virtual reality and battle, it's just so. Like, yeah. Oh, it's yeah. awful. Like really awful dialogue that Pierce Brosnan has to say throughout this whole film. <laughs> <laughs> I've wrote as well that like the balls to open this film with that as a cold open with the monkey going through the facility and shooting the uh, the security guard, and then the way that it cuts to the titles is with such confidence. Uh, it's like the monkey shoots somebody, and then it's like Bzz! New Line Cinema presents. <laughs> it's like what? 
Yeah, I think also as well, I had it much worse than you did because I think it's worth noting at this point that we both watched completely different versions of the film. Yes, I'm quite eager to know what is different in regards from the theatrical cut to the director's cut. Apparently, from what I can see from the trailer, it has more monkey. Oh, the monkey stuff's way longer, like way longer. I mean, even that cold open is a lot longer than it is in the theatrical because I did manage to watch the first 15 minutes of the theatrical this morning. And yeah, I'm pretty sure that cold open's like five minutes longer than uh, <laughs> that. There's a lot more of him working his way around the facility. Is this Terence Malick's The Lawnmower Man? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it is significantly longer than the theatrical. It's about 24 minutes longer or something than the theatrical. Yeah. The bulk of that is from the first half of the film. So, yeah, there's a lot more of the monkey, a lot more of Job in his simple form, and the subplot with the uh, father. Right, got you. Like the reverend. Oh, yeah, the reverend. Oh, of course. The thing is, I already feel like there's enough of that in the actual theatrical cut, yeah, to be honest. Yeah. How does it play out in the director's cut in terms of it having more of that? Because it sounds to me like it doesn't have... I use air quotes as i say this but it doesn't have more of the good stuff it's more so just like the character work which yeah already it probably has too much of in this in this yeah. film anyway yeah watching the theatrical this morning i was like oh, i wish i'd seen that because it's so much punchier and it gives you all the information that you need it's a lot more streamlined and gets you to the important points a lot quicker whereas the director's cut drags quite significantly and it does feel a bit malformed because of it. Okay. All right. Yeah. So going forward from here, like we've mentioned, Andy has watched the director's cut. I've watched the theatrical cut. So we both have slightly different experiences of this film. I don't think that's really going to affect our approach no. to the quality of the overall <laughs> film, mind you. This is not a Kingdom of Heaven type situation that we have here. No. Okay, so yes, I'm really going to go through my notes, what I have on this film, because I have such like individual moments that I want to talk about. One of them is, and I'm going to use this really as an opening to the door of Pierce Brosnan. Let's yeah. open Pierce Brosnan's door and squeeze our way in. <laughs> so, um, the monkey certainly did. Yeah, yeah he's... <laughs> oh my god. That monkey. He's sticking that ray gun somewhere. Oh my word. Yeah, to be fair, one of the notes I've got about this is, and it saves a lot, I think one of the things that this film got right, like 100% correct, is that for all that it presents as a massive technological leap, that it takes this VR element and it's like, this is the future. This is where our gods will be made. They present it as being such a technological leap forward that it's going to change the fabric of humanity itself. Yeah. Yeah. And people use it for porn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and cat videos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can has cheeseburger. Like, yeah. <laughs> just being beamed directly into your mind. Um, but yeah, I think this film got that absolutely spot on because at every single turn, this film has an abundance of shots of people floating in an era trim or on some... I don't know, home sex table with some Oculus Rift strapped <laughs> to the head whilst they're just moaning like, oh, oh, yeah. And then when it cuts to... But what they're seeing is just some, like, floating in bubbles and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the Pierce Brodin's got some weird fantasies in this film. Oh, yeah. But yes, it's a... Uh, it's interesting to talk about Pierce Brosnan. There's one line that I really love in the film very early on, and uh, that is when he gets a phone call after he's spoken to his wife. And they're having some bad time. I don't know what that's about. He gets a phone call, and somebody just simply says to him <laughs> over the phone, your chimp's dead. And <laughs> but all, all that Pierce Brosnan says on his side of the conversation is straight from answering the phone. It's like, yeah, what, huh, meh. And then it cuts away. <laughs> and I was like, I want to see that in the script. <laughs> like, <laughs> But uh, that really opens me up to talk about Pierce Brosnan in this film. Because this yeah. is pre-Bond Brosnan. You know? This is baby Brosnan. Post-Remington Steel, but pre-Bond. Yeah, this is Wilderness Years Brosnan. That I mean, I was looking into it before. And the years between... 1987 and 1992 were not kind to him at all. Um, yeah. Because, yeah, he'd lost the Bond gig. 
you know, you should have been James Bond in The Living Daylights if... Um, if you listen to our License to Kill podcast, we go into a lot of detail about that. It's a very good episode. One of our highest rated. One of our highest yeah. listened to on the show, in fact. <laughs> Plug. <laughs> but he went from losing the Bond gig and having to do those five TV movies of uh, Remington Steel. Then yeah. on location in India, uh, shooting another film, he discovers that his wife has been diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Ah. And basically throughout that whole period between 87 up oh. until her death on the 28th of December, 91. Yeah. He's just not having a good time. And Lil Merman was shot at the tail end of that. I, th- uh, I, <laughs> I think you undershot that just a little bit. But oh, just with the, He's not having a good time, is he? No. It's a very English way to put it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I managed to find the shooting dates for Lil Merman. And they, they started production on the 28th of May, 91. So... I think when you view the film in that context, I genuinely think that his uh, he's not a happy bunny doing no. this film, and you can kind of tell, I think. Yeah, his character is very angry throughout, even in the yeah, scenes yeah. in which he's supposed to be quite affable, and um, the scenes in which, for example, he's trying to seduce the neighbor kid and Job to his basement, where he's supposed to be actually, you know, the cool neighbor. He comes across yeah. as kind of angry throughout i actually don't think his performance is that bad in this film to be honest uh, it's, he becomes such a peripheral character i would say is uh, the script kind of le- leaves him behind for the largest part and the yeah. issue is i think he plays it a little bit too angry throughout that we don't really get to like him as a character either but yeah is he the antagonist in fact in this film when you look at it from another another angle perhaps in a way he is but I think Operation U Tree might want to have a few words with him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a strange old narrative anyway. I think it's just, I don't think it's been um, thought through particularly well. Oh. <laughs> the elements don't gel together particularly well, and people's arcs are all over the place. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's a strangely um, chauvinistic piece as well, I thought. Oh, very much so. Yeah, very much a product of its time, or maybe even before then, because, yeah, the way it handles the women in this script is very odd. Every single female character in this film is either a passive passenger or is actively antagonistic or is just kind of a vessel for abuse or even a predator, (laughs) as as is presented by one of the neighbour characters. Yeah. has the hots for Job long before he ha- he actually becomes smart. Yeah. The way that she is looking at him while he's eating his sandwiches, he's like sat down mumbling to himself like an, an infant while he's eating his jam butties. Yeah. And she's like, whoa, look at him. I want a, I want a <laughs> piece of that. He's dressed like Stewie or Family Guy. <laughs> oh, he can inspect her fluids. <laughs> uh. I'm more well on. And he does. Anytime. Munches his way through that. Oh, no. But the film has a very strange atmosphere all the way through. Yeah. I think it's enhanced in the director's cut as well because you spend so much more time in that world. In that little community. Outside of the VSI facility, you spend so much more time with those characters and get to know them a bit more. That Yeah, the whole feeling of that place is just off. I think I'm going to have to compare this with Toys for that because I think it's another film where every single element in the film just feels slightly off. Yeah, like nothing quite works. There's nothing that you can point to in this film that says, well, at least that's good. I mean, like I say, I don't think Pierce Brosnan is particularly awful in this film, but its character doesn't work and it's still played in a way that's still slightly off. Even the better elements of the film are slightly off. And one of the films that it actually reminded me a lot of, and I've written it down several times in my notes, and I mean, one reason is for very obvious reasons, but it's Highlander 2. It's mm. the film that it reminds me a lot of. Yeah. I mean, obviously, similar times, like similar era of filmmaking, but also, yeah. yeah, that VSI building just looks like the Shield Corporation, right down to the blue lighting. Yeah. Right down to the uh, bad English boardroom villain, as played by an yeah. American. It's Dean Norris in this film, yeah. And in Highlander 2, it's John C. McGinley. Yeah, And I've written as well that they should join forces in some sort of Expendables-type film for boardroom villainy. (laughs) And I would very much pay to see that film. Yeah. And also, I think for a film that's sort of looking towards the future, it does have an 80s vibe to it. 
It does, and I think as well, like it's um, it's because it's taking a technology that at the time is in its infancy, and they are pushing it so far to an extreme point that <laughs> essentially that, like you say, VR is this thing that we are going to use, you know, along with some sort of medical mumbo jumbo to create what could be digital gods. The, the next phase, it's essentially like 2001 and that this is the next step in human evolution. Yeah. And yeah. what do we actually use VR for? It didn't really catch on. And even now we still just use it to play like Guitar Hero type games. <laughs> where, <laughs> and maybe Half-Life first person shooters. And that's about it, really. I think I did one where I was on a runaway mine train. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> It's not come to a fruition, these grand ideas of what VR could be used for. In the no. 90s, I mean, this was a big thing. I, like, people thought that we were going to be escaping into the world of VR. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. You know, as we were going to be meeting up in virtual chat rooms and stuff like that and just plug yourself in Matrix style and go for a wonder. Yeah, it was funny watching people talk about it at the time now because you just go like, yeah, yeah, that's all cool, but... I think people are just already forgetting that the graphics are really shit. <laughs> like, when you do see it in this film as well, it does look like a headache simulator. Like, oh, it it, does. it's just yeah. a migraine simulator. You, especially the flying scenes that they have. I mean, I have a lot to say about what is presented in this film. The sex thing as well. They go to the sex oh, well man. quite often for a dip. And what it presents to us as a sexual experience in the world of VR. It's slightly on the odd side, I would say. I think uh, when Job and the neighbour woman, I forgot her name, Janine Saville. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when they have their sexual experience, he makes some reference to, oh, it's our primitive mind or something like that. This is a representation of our primitive mind. He turns into a butterfly at one point, and yeah. they're both like wailing in orgasmic joy. There's nothing sexual or sexy about any of the VR imagery that we are seeing here. <laughs> <laughs> he mentions that she has weird sexual fantasies at one point. I think his uh, his are quite beyond the pale. Or the orifice monster that he creates. Yeah, it looks like a bad VR version of the Howard the Duck monster at the end. Um, yeah, it does. <laughs> that's that's what it reminded me of. For some reason, that seems to be a monster we go back to often in a sh in our podcast as well. Yeah, that's Jenny Wright as well, isn't it? That um, the actress. Yeah, from um, Near Dark. Oh, is it? Yeah, I did not know. I hadn't made the connection. Yeah, because I just thought I found that she had unusually high billing, considering how much she's in the film. I was going to ask if she's in the director's cut longer, or is no, it just no? No, oh, right. And the fact that she has third billing as well, like it's very strange. She might be in the director's cut a little bit more, but you're talking like an extra thirty seconds to a minute. Yeah, I mean that's the thing with the director's cut as well. You spend so much more time with Job in his initial form. I mean, so much time, in fact, that I wrote on my notes, this just feels like a full-length version of that trailer from Tropic Thunder, The Simple Jack. It's inescapable. I feel like that trailer, it took a lot of inspiration from this film, because even down to the way that his hair looks in the film. It really is. I mean, I know that they mentioned this in the How Did This Get Made episode of this show, so I was wondering whether or not I should mention it in this episode, but it is inescapable. You have to mention it, because... It's so obviously the touchstone reference for Simple Jack. Yeah. It really is like, this is what they are taking the piss out of. You cannot escape it. And when you watch that <laughs> film, that is all I can see. All I can yeah. see is Simple Jack. And it does feel like this film is the parody of Hollywood actors doing slow. <laughs> I'm using yeah. air quotes. Doing, you know, a simple-minded individual, as they would often refer to it. And it feels like this is the film that's a parody of that, even though it's not. It's playing it completely straight. And yeah. I, I mean, I like Jeff Fahey as well. He's a fine actor. He did a lot of B-movies in the 80s and 90s. That I quite like him. I, another film that he did at the time is Body Parts, which is great. It's a lot of fun. It's like a modern day Frankenstein meets, I don't know, like seven. Mm. It's like got a serial killer element to it as well. I like Jeff Fahey, but this role is played so broad in his simpleness 
that it just comes across as parody. And I think we would be doing the film a disservice if we didn't mention Simple Jack. <laughs> yeah, it's all the more worse in the director's cut because you see him as that for such a long... And he, I think he's that version of that character for at least half an hour. <laughs> really? So it's quite some time then until you get him into those ass-hugging jeans. Oh, yeah. It's quite a long time, yeah. When he gets punched to the ground and he does that turnaround, for some reason, I don't know why, but the frame really makes sure that they get in his big bubble butt into the frame as he turns around (laughs) and he strikes a pose that makes it look like something out of Playgirl magazine, I assume. (laughs) (laughs) I also think that the smarter that Job gets, the less clothes he wears. Yeah. That seems to be a prominent theme in this in yeah. this film. There's much more plot regarding the abuse that the father gives him. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm not sure whether in the theatrical there's the whole belt whipping scene. There is, there is. Apparently there's more in the director's cut yeah. of the actual abuse. There's only that one belt whipping scene that we see. And that's it. And to be honest, that is enough. I already feel like that whole section of the film is probably something that you could take out entirely. Because I I will say as well, this film is like, even in its theatrical cut, it's about an hour and 45 minutes long or so. And I would say even with that, I still feel like you could cut it down to 90 minutes. Oh, definitely. I mean, it would still be shit. but (laughs) And the fact I watched a two hours, 20 minute version as well. It's like, and you were introduced to the, the Reverend character long before you meet his brother which yeah. in a theatrical cut is the other way around. You don't see that character until way afterwards. The fact that they're brothers, though, in the theatrical cut is such a... It's an offhand comment that's made that it never really pays off in any meaningful way or anything like that. I think you may have noticed when you watch this film, Andy, but there are some biblical references just hidden and scattered throughout. <laughs> you know, you may, have, you may have noticed them, you may not have, they may have passed you by, they're very deep and hidden in the film. You have to be smart like me or like Donald Trump to really get to, <laughs> to know these things. I've done tests online, so oh, I know wow. I'm very smart when it comes to looking yeah. for these things in films. But you may have noticed that there are some biblical references. Mm, mm. And I'm wondering if the whole them being brothers is some sort of play on a biblical story that I haven't read. Because, I mean, obviously you've got Job, the book of Job. But I'm not really clued up on the Bible enough to know what the reference is to. And I'm thinking that perhaps that's something that's at play because those characters don't make sense to me in terms of their inclusion within this story and what they represent in the grand yeah. scheme of things. Yeah, and I don't understand the whole um, stereotype Irish thing they've got going with them either. <laughs> <laughs> this is someone that's mentioned on another podcast, but I have to mention the accents. And another thing, this is yeah. another thing that reminded me of Highlander in that, you know, we have Piers Brosnan, an Irish man playing an American in this film. Or Brit, I don't know. British. It's somewhere in between. It's like yeah, what yeah. Liam Neeson does now. Yeah. <laughs> where, where it's it's some transatlantic nonsense, but anyway, it seems to be working for him. But I'd say Pierce Brosnan is the same. He's an Irish actor as well, playing some vaguely American individual. And then you have some American actors playing some very broadly Irish individuals. <laughs> so <laughs> it's got that kind of mix-up of accents as well. And the Irish accents, they're very broad, but also completely different. I think it's even more wonky in the director's cut because they build it up so much. And then the way that they utilise those two characters doesn't make an awful lot of sense given how much they've built those characters up. So I'm not sure whether that's better in the theatrical because they are given a lot of screen time in the director's cut. It sounds to me like that's where the cutting has come into play yeah, in terms yeah. of those characters. The one that does get a lot of screen time is his, like his employer. Yeah, He is like Job's one true ally in this world. And actually, that's the one character I think, if you're going to have either of these characters, that's the one that should remain. There's already enough oh, yeah, people in this world to show that you know Job is on the bottom rung of society in this world. You've already got like the gas station villain that yeah. knocks him about and that type of thing. You don't need somebody to be belting him about the, the, the house while he's at home. No. You know? No, I think yeah, yeah, you could easily have cut that whole church element out of the film because him being in the church and everything doesn't really collate with all the other jobs that he does in no. terms of him being a handyman. 
around the town. So yeah, you could have just gotten rid of that whole angle and just have the one character and then yeah, the gas station villain. But I mean, yeah, it still would be a shit film. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I'm talking about like we can improve this film. Yeah. We can do it. You can't save this. No. It's too far gone. You know what's a line that really made me uncomfortable? And we've already talked about, I keep on calling her Janine Savile, but I really I keep forgetting her name. I've already mentioned about how creepy it is that she kind of seduces Job or makes plans to seduce Job. She essentially preys on him very early on because he's not at a point mentally and really in which you would say that he could provide proper consent for <laughs> yeah, for what she, uh, what she wants from him. But there is a point later that I wrote that where she says, give me your tongue. And I wrote, this is very uncomfortable. Please make it stop. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is the point where I pressed pause and was like, I'm going to watch the rest of this later. You know, when, when my daughter can't burst in the room at any moment to ask what I'm doing. Isn't it a bit straight after where like he feels her boobs and it goes, oh, look, nice and soft. Yes, it's very Forrest Gump. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit Gen A. Yeah, it is. I tried to hurt you, Gen A. <laughs> it's not good in any way possible. And it's just the whole VR thing that follows makes it worse. But to be honest, none of the VR looks really very appealing to me whatsoever. No. It's weird to watch this now and think that when I was a kid, I was like, fuck yeah, this is the future. This is. <laughs> it's all happening here. Between this and Reboot, the Canadian show. and Oh, man, it looks like an episode of Reboot. The I mean, new adventures of Johnny Quest. I was yeah. in this shit. <laughs> I, <laughs> honestly, it, and it makes me think right now, you know, when you get older and you look back at these things with hindsight and you can really reframe it against other films of the time and other films of now. And I, and I really think to myself, man, what a shit tasting film I had as a five year old. <laughs> <laughs> I also think, what the fuck were my parents thinking? Let me watch yeah. this shit. Oh, man. And as well, like, we've not even got into the whole, like, evil scheme. You're going to have to shine some light on this for me. What are they using this for? Like, what is this whole... I've got it. Monkey Space War. Yeah. (laughs) But it feels like there's a real disconnect between the military application idea and the intelligence angle. Like, it just doesn't feel like they really go together. Yeah. Or it's just very malformed. I don't know what they're trying to achieve. I mean, it seems like the main angle of the film is for Pierce Brosnan to make simpler things more intelligent. Yeah. And then, yeah, that goes off track when they switch the medication and stuff. But I don't know what Pierce Brosnan's endgame is with this, with his research. I think that is a genuine, like, I mean, everything's a genuine issue with the film. But one of the strongest, (laughs) one of the strongest issues with it is I get the A plot. The A plot is about Job being experimented upon and he becomes far more intelligent to the point in which he begins to break out of the bounds of his kind of physical form. And I think, yeah, there's a story there. There is a story with an A plot there, but the B plot is practically non-existent and it's so muddled that I don't know how this plays in the grander scheme in the world that we've set up. And I think what we need is in this is a more of a connection between how Job plays into this world but also we need to know what they're building towards because I feel like this film lacks drive because of that yeah the yeah. Job story is just for a while it feels like the same scenes repeating themselves which is just Job goes to Pierce Brosnan's basement gets injected full of Pierce Brosnan juice puts on a <laughs> VR Brosnan helmet juice, yeah. does something crazy for a bit goes out and mows some lawns then the cycle repeats itself over and over again each time he gets progressively a little bit smarter and a little bit more naked <laughs> and that's it for a large chunk of the film and yeah it, I, I remember thinking like where are we going with this what's the direction it, it feels completely aimless at this moment in time and i think it's that it's the fact that there's not a second plot really that you can hang your hat on and say this is what the film's playing into this is the the larger point that it's making. Yeah, when that whole montage bit started as well, because obviously it starts way later in in the director's (laughs) cut, I just wrote bullshit science and unethical too. (laughs) Like, you know, right down to the fact that it gives him seizures and stuff like that. Like, this is not... Who signed off on this? Like, this guy's going to jail. Yeah. (laughs) 
it's like it's um oh it's not good the whole thing is muddled as well especially with with angelo's story because the wife disappears halfway through and doesn't reappear for quite some time wait she reappears in your one yeah do you not have that in yours where she gets sh- like shot to death where job controls her okay that's not no nope, the... that is not in the theatrical version or at least i was doing something when that happened but no she does not return It's pretty brutal. I mean, it definitely plays into the sort of chauvinistic part of the film. There is a bit... I mean, you get the whole thing where Job controls people's minds in the theatrical. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you do, yeah. It starts with him controlling, like, objects, and then he can start to control people. Because he wipes the minds of the coppers as well when they're investigating the case of the neighbour being killed by the lawnmower. Yeah, so there's a bit later on where, because Pierce Brosnan is on the run by that point... The VSI guards go to his home and Job is there as well and through the mind control, it's just before you get the bubble people, just before <laughs> right, that. Right, yeah. But before that, his wife suddenly appears again and she's c- completely controlled by Job and he gives her a gun and he gets her to shoot all these people, all these guards, and then the guards retaliate back whilst Pierce Brosnan's tied up and they just shoot holes in her. Like, they just, like, mow her down. Man, she gets a short shrift in this film then yeah. as well like in terms of a, a a treatment but as you say it is really bad to the way that it does treat its women in this film i i also think of the abused neighbor who's a victim of uh, domestic abuse but also the way that all of the neighbors at one point when the father returns home from work and immediately gets out of his car and starts slapping his kid around in the driveway and everybody on the street is just stood there watching like oh that's that is really awful. <laughs> it's like a Bill Bailey thing, isn't it? It like, really ooh, is. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Even Dean Norris later on when he sees like some people turn into bubble people, like he gets to watch his guards get absolutely their very being being torn apart and turned into bubbles and then and he's like, Ooh, I want that power. I want that power. <laughs> At first, he just, like, turns off his screen and leans back in his chair like, oh, I'm sure this will work itself out. Later on as well, when she and... The, I forget what the kid's called. The kid from Last Action oh, Hero. Oh, Peter. Yeah, Last Action Hero guy. <laughs> He's the only character that returns for the sequel. <laughs> oh, Poor really? guy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Playing my Playing the gosh. same character. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously? Yeah. And what, does he befriend another simple gardener? <laughs> oh, it, it takes place in the future. I, I, the sequel might be a good one to do at some point because it, it is a honorary member of IMDb's bottom 100. It's got to be done then. It's it's on the list firmly. But yeah, like it's just that Peter character seems to be quite significant for what happens at the end, yet mm-hmm. we barely see him throughout the rest of the film. He's kind of there in the director's cut, at least. He's there at the beginning. Yeah. Especially when Job is into his comics and things like that, and he's going all about, like, Cyberman and stuff. But then throughout the whole middle of the film, after the first initial experiments, he just disappears for a long time, right up until the lawnmower attack, really. Yeah, and as I mentioned with the mum as well, after they give um, Angelo... Pierce Brosnan's character, Angelo, a lift to the evil bad guy's lure... He tells them, he says, drive away, don't wait for me, just drive away, go elsewhere. And so she drives just a little bit down the road (laughs) and falls asleep, (laughs) allowing Peter to just exit the car and run into the building for reasons unknown. Yeah. I was going to ask, is that expanded upon in the director's cut? Is there a reason she just falls asleep at the wheel of the car? Is that something that Job's done? Nope. Because it made me laugh. No, I don't think so. She just falls asleep for Peter to just come in because they need Peter to be in the building because it's a plot point. Yeah, uh, because it has to happen. Because plot because dictates script. that he needs to be there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a terribly constructed script, actually. It's not a good script at all. I mean, this is what I mean when I talk about this being the wilderness years for mm-hmm. Pierce Brosnan because I don't... I tried to find something on Pierce Brosnan talking about this film, but I don't think he talks about this film favourably. You can see why. I mean... The thing is as well, I I don't think Pierce Brosnan is one of the most versatile actors in the world, but he's got a lot of charm. He's very Mm. affable. He comes across well in films as well. I mean, you look at films like The Matador as well, which I think he should get a lot more credit for than he actually does. I think for a long time he was kind of typecast. And there is something to Pierce Brosnan that makes him 
really quite endearing. And this film doesn't have any of that whatsoever, really, for him. Mm. I can see why he wouldn't look upon its making memorably or fondly. Mm. And is it me? Does security seem very lax at that VSI facility? They seem to just <laughs> stroll in and out of that place and do various things without any kind of security yes, supervision. Definitely. And I will also ask as well, the monkey in the uh, director's cut. So there's more yeah. monkey magic in the director's cut. So does the monkey actually escape the facility? Yeah. What happens with that? Because I was watching the trailer and I saw that there were shots of the monkey with its helmet on in the like. Oh, is the monkey world. not killed in the theatrical? It's killed in the very opening scene. It shoots the security guard, and then you see some, um, right. some footage of, I guess, the security guards open fire, and you're led to believe that the monkey was shot dead. Ah, right. So something really weird happens in the director's cut, which I think it's like, the director's cut feels very unfinished. You can actually see where the quality of the film, because I think the actual, um, the source of the film is slightly different. Like it's not yeah. bad quality. It's just it's. I think one's from a negative, and one's from an interpositive. So there's a slight color shift. Yeah, but sometimes it actually jumps in the middle of a shot where you can tell where they've cut the shot. Ah, right. Yeah, and the audio is not quite as good. But the shot of Pierce Brosnan on the phone where they tell him that the monkey's dead is still in the director's cut. But there is like another 10 minutes involving the monkey after that that's in the director's cut so yeah in the director's cut the monkey escapes and hides out in job's hut and job has a big long scene with him talking about how he looks like his favorite comic book hero cyberman and he shows him all these comics and everything and he's sort of holed up in this um in job's hut and then the vsi guards come to job's house and shoot the monkey and, and shoot the monkey and what? Pierce Brosnan's there to try and stop them. I would say the way that the film is put together feels very amateurish and even down to the score, like the score feels very TV movie. Like yeah. It just feels like it was done in a day with a guy with a keyboard. Well, to be honest, that adds to the um, Twin Peaksy style to me yeah, yeah. in that it, it's got that Baldamenti thing about it as well, where it feels very synthy, but also, um, as I say, when I make references to Twin Peaks, I mean, this feels like it's done without any of the irony or anything like that, you know, or any yeah, of the yeah. wit. Or, But for some reason, these characters, because they act in such absurd ways and because of the sound as well, it's got this real kind of absurd soap opera-ish element to it. And I think it's the TV moviness of it as well that makes me think of that era of TV that we were getting, like Twin Peaks mm. and stuff like that. But obviously not done anywhere near as well no no but um i've got a couple things that i need to add as well just before we do get into the stats and facts one thing mm. is that i think this film has a record number of people that really need to have their hard drives checked <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> and the other thing is we can't really finish discussion of the film without making mention of it being the battle of the mullets with this <laughs> we even have symbolism in the mullets we oh, have yeah. the light versus dark. But it is strange how Job and uh, Angelo, <laughs> Job and Angelo, oh my gosh, end up with these light and dark mullets. And it's like a, a face off. Yeah, I mean, Pierce Brosnan is rocking his floppy hair at this point. I mean, oh, yeah. It's a bit more tamed in, say, films like Goldeneye and Mrs. Doubtfire and things. But yeah. at this point, it's in its full glory. I, I just think the look of that character is odd in of itself with the whole Hawaiian shirts and white shorts and the little earring that he has and the glasses. And the earring is The chain very, smoking yeah. and the... It, that, that character just doesn't feel right. Do you think that's what he was just doing on set at the time? Just rolling onto camera, smoking? Like, I'm not taking my earring out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel like the pain that's going on. <laughs> <laughs> but Jeff Fye is rocking like his sort of Jeff Daniels' Dumb and Dumber haircut. That haircut, man, it is so Dumb and Dumber. It's very... I, I almost said straw man then, like an argument. Yeah. <laughs> but it is very Scarecrow-esque as well. Yeah. And it's kind of funny to think that yeah, maybe Dumb and Dumber took inspiration from the Lawnmower Man for that look, because obviously that came out like two years, three years later or something. I think that this film must have been something of a laughing stock in some circles in Hollywood for the, the amount that seems to have taken inspiration from it for the wrong or right reasons, depending on the way that you look at it. But I yeah, feel yeah. like it might have been a bit of a laughing stock in Hollywood. I think so. Because even when I was 
younger and this film was kind of still in vogue for its CGI, mm -hmm. I'd always heard that it wasn't a good film, but the graphics were cool. Yeah. Like, that just seemed to be the general feeling, like the general consensus. But yeah, when he starts getting more smart and he gets that sort of uh, Marlboro cowboy look going on. <laughs> <laughs> and then obviously when he turns into a Tron character later on as well. like yep. um, Apparently it was originally meant to be uh, orange and it didn't look good on him. So they changed it to a bleach blonde <laughs> instead. Could you imagine it though with orange? Oh man, it would look even more comical. But, <laughs> yeah, I feel like that whole arc for that character feels very muddled because I get that, yeah, Angelo's trying to make him a better character and he's learning. And then obviously that gets corrupted at some point. With the uh, change in medication and like the whole Project 5 thing that these sinister corporations got going on. Like they mentioned Project 5 and really go into it very late on in the theatrical cut, but it seems to come out of nowhere. And I remember, I was just like, I don't know what Project 5 is. Yeah. You know, I think that's maybe a casualty of the theatrical cut, but it's mentioned <laughs> more in the director's cut, like that whole Project 5 thing. But even so, that just doesn't flow particularly well from one no. scene to the next in terms of his journey to becoming that godlike figure, that corrupted godlike figure. It doesn't... In a no. way, I feel like the only time it works is towards the end, actually. I do like the bit where he's now fully digital and he's trying to get out. Even though the CGI is a bit wonky, it kind of works in a way. Yeah, I, I like the stakes at that point as well. Yeah, like yeah. It's in terms of him escaping into a digital world in which... In a world that's increasingly relying on digital technology, especially at like the 90s, while that kind of revolution starts to take place, computers are starting to take off, they're already becoming household objects as well. I like that this is what it's playing into, that... In a world that relies on digital technology, this person is now going to become this digital god that really can take advantage of it. It's like he's Skynet almost. And I yeah. like thematically what that's playing with. It's just like that's the only thing that thematically works for me. Like everything else surrounding it, the build up to it, the way that it actually gets there, it's just so poorly handled. Oh, yeah, yeah. There is a kernel of a good idea in that. I do like the idea. I mean, that the execution of it within turning into the shrivelly man with the <laughs> plaster head and stuff. It's just <laughs> hilarious. But I think the idea of him having so much hubris as to turn himself entirely into like pure energy, this digital character, and the fact that when Pierce Brosnan enters the scene, that he remarks on the fact that in doing so, he's lost all of his power in the physical world, and he mm -hmm. kind of didn't realise that. There's a good idea in yeah. that. But it's a shame that it was kept until right to the end of the film. <laughs> yeah. To be honest, I don't think in the theatrical version they allow you to dwell on the fact that um, his physical body's been kind of, like, shriveled. You see it from, like, a, a very far shot that, like, he looks diminished physically. But yeah, they don't yeah. really go into it or allow you to dwell on it at all. He shrivels up and he's like, I'm in. And it's like... <laughs> <laughs> and it's like it just sort of like sucks up i don't know where it goes like the brain but, um, worm out of um starship troopers <laughs> yeah i don't know why they bothered to do that to be honest i think it would have been better just to have just left his body like dead yeah lifeless something. and limp yeah because it just looks really goofy but i'm pretty sure when pierce brosnan picks him up there's like this thing where he picks up the head is still like just about there but then you get a, like an over projection of the cgi version of job and then the head just falls off or turns into dust it was almost like they didn't need to do that. I mean, no. Unless they just thought, oh, we need like a visual to demonstrate that he's gone on to, over yeah, to the other side. Yeah, his powerlessness in the physical yeah, world. But I don't think it was executed particularly well. <laughs> that I don't think it was executed particularly well is the statement to take away from this yeah. film. The only other thing I liked about the, in terms of the effects anyway, that I thought worked quite well was the bubble man. I thought that actually looked quite good for the time. I had questions about what was actually happening oh, to Oh, I had no idea what that is, but I thought it looked quite cool. <laughs> yeah. And you have that guy as well, that the little lackey for um, Piers Brosnan. Is Tim's. Little, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Tim's. And he's just kind of left in limbo, constantly yeah. fluctuating between Bubble Man and not. And you never really get a resolution to that. No, and you don't get a resolution to Dean Norris either, like... He just disappears. He does. Like, he makes one last mention of, like, uh, Joe being power, the future. Yeah. yeah, I can use that power. And that's it. That's the last time that you hear or see of him in the theatrical cut, at least. I don't know if Sequel. that's the case. <laughs> 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 I'm sure Dean Norris was uh, chomping at the bit to be back into the sequel. Yeah. Okay, so uh, do you have anything further to add in regards to Lawnmower Man before we move on to the stats and facts? Um, 
Yeah, I just like the ending when he's trying to get through the different combinations, and then obviously I like the telephone ring at the end, which is quite effective, I think. But yeah, that's probably the film's best singular moment is the yeah. uh, the telephone ringing. <laughs> what the last thirty seconds? The last thirty <laughs> seconds. Yeah. <laughs> So moving over to the stats and facts, I have some information to impart some wisdom. I will say as well, I've actually decided today to uh, forego the usual Empire magazine review and move towards Variety for this week's critic review of choice. But before we get there, I'll just start off with the uh, box office numbers. This film had a budget of $10 million, so it's very much like our previous Tremors episode. A few years later, so... If that $10 million has changed, if it has, it won't be by much. And the box office overall, and we only really had the domestic numbers for in terms of what this film made, and it made $32 million at the uh, domestic box office. So considering that it's opened you know, across Europe as well, where I imagine this type of film would have played quite well, mm. I think that this film probably turned a pretty penny. Like It's not a smash box office hit, but enough that the people involved probably made a little bit of cash off this. Yeah, I think it's a minor hit as well, and it's a testament that even though the sequel is of very, very poor quality, it was actually released theatrically. Oh, really? I always thought that the sequel, I've never seen it, but I always thought it was direct-to-DVD. No, it might have been direct-to-DVD in other territories, but I think domestically it was released theatrically, and I think it bombed pretty hard. Ah, right. So I imagine that the honeymoon period was over for the (laughs) lawnmower man at that point. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And it opened to number two in a weekend that included films such as number one was Wayne's World. Right. And then you had The Lawnmower Man. And then you had Fried Green Tomatoes or Tomatoes. You know, you say tomato, I say tomato. And then you had the film Gladiator. That would be the Cuba Gooding Jr. and James Ah. Marshall from Twin Peaks version of the film. I think it was about boxers. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. You might not have known this, but it's actually a remake. Uh, Ridley <laughs> Scott's Gladiator is a remake of this film. Yeah, yeah. And then there was a film called Once Upon a Crime. Mm. I don't know what that was. And then there's the classic Sylvester Stallone film Stop or My Mom Will Shoot, <laughs> followed by the classic John Carpenter film Memoirs of an Invisible Man. <sighs> Which is definitely one that's on my list to review on this uh, podcast. Uh, And then you have Medicine Man, The Hand That Rocked the Cradle, and finally at number 10, Beauty and the Beast. Ah, yeah. So that's a holdover from uh, Thanksgiving 91. It certainly is. And to say, this film released in March, Beauty and the Beast was still in the top 10. Yeah. From November 91 till March 1992, Beauty and the Beast was still holding a top 10 spot. Yeah, you can tell that this is a, it's not quite fuck you, it's January, but it's that sleeper pre-summer roster. Of course, yeah, like quite on the low budget side of things, but it is that now we live in a time in which every month is a blockbuster month for film. I think the seasons have gone out the window now, I don't think, they have. I think this whole idea of summer is gone. Like, completely. Completely. I think yeah. every month is one in which studios are looking to carve out their blockbuster tentpole for that particular month. <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> the prospect of a summer release, especially in the UK, always kind of puzzled me because I was thinking, right, if you want to make money in the UK, just release it when the weather's really terrible. You do not want to be releasing big films when the weather's nice. Yeah, nobody wants to go to the cinema while the weather's nice. In America, they have this thing about, because I know it's like uh, with the East Coast being quite hot in certain areas, they have this thing where releasing it in the summer peak, summer period, is because people are driven to the cinemas where it's because of the air conditioning. Yeah, they want to cool off. Yeah, but we don't have that here. If we see a glimpse of sun, we've got our shorts and t-shirts on and we're (laughs) out in the garden. (laughs) Yeah. Sat there in like 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, it's like, burn me, burn me. (laughs) And uh, moving over to the uh, critics' consensus, well, the Rotten Tomatoes score is 34%, and it has a 4.68 average rating, so that's 4.68 out of 10. Mm -hmm. And the consensus for the film is that the Lawnmower Man suffers from a predictable, melodramatic script, and its once groundbreaking visual effects look dated today, which is uh, very much spot on, but I don't Mm -hmm. think it touches upon the absurdity of this film as well. Yeah, yeah. As mentioned, I've gone for a positive critic review, 
and this is from Variety in 2009. So this is divorced from the release of the film, but they've written dazzling computer animation and special effects overcome the lawnmower man's mundane story. And um, I think I disagree, <laughs> especially from the vantage point of 2009. Oh, yeah. And the audience score f- on Rotten Tomatoes is 31% with a 2.75 out of 5 average rating. And the IMDb score is 5.5 out of 10, which um, I imagine, to be honest, it's a little bit on the high side. But I, I imagine from the point of nostalgia, I can probably understand that for people that I want to say grew up with this film but knew it of that period and what it represented in that period of film and mm. that beginning of the CGI revolution. I imagine some people perhaps have rated that based on seeing it then, not revisiting it later. Yeah. Okay, so really that's um, everything I have in regards to The Lawnmower Man. I will say that is it a film that I would recommend? From the sounds of it, I would say perhaps not the director's cut, but there's enough absurdity in the theatrical cut that it's probably worth a watch in the right circumstances. But it's not a film that I would recommend as being something of a high quality. If you fancy laughing at a film for a bit and feeling very awkward with some quite creepy uh, come down to my basement and (laughs) watching women (laughs) seduce simple-minded individuals, then... Yeah. Yeah, you know, if, if that's where you get your kicks... This film is for you, yeah. you horrible fucker. <laughs> but yeah, definitely, I would not waste your time with the director's cut because it's much slower. A lot of the extra things don't really add up to very much. And, you know, it's a two hour, 20 minute film of which, yeah, it should be 90 minutes long. Even just watching through the theatrical, you know, the first 15 minutes, the way that it plays out is much slicker. I wouldn't say it's a director's cut. It feels more like an assembly. Ah, right, yeah. So, um, yeah, if you are going to watch this, then just stick to the theatrical because it gives you all you need to know anyway. So, Yeah, and perhaps it's one of those films that should be watched with a few friends and a few beers. Oh, definitely. Than, yeah, uh, based on its merits. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, so that's been our Lawn Mower Man episode. If you join us next week, we will be uh, looking at the swelling from down below. As we watch Deep Rising, um, a film that I've been uh, wanting to do on this podcast for some time, and I cannot wait to revisit. I know that you, Andy, this is one of your particular favourites. Oh, yeah, I want to get my Treat Williams fix. (laughs) But until then, it's a bye from myself. And bye from me, Cybo Man. (laughs) Simple Andy. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for listening. (laughs) 